It's time for Unit 4, Lecture 3 on Land Management and Conservation, the last lecture in Unit 4. We talked about how we use land, and we've talked about urban land. So now we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about what we're doing with all that rural land. We know what we're doing with the urban land. We're building stuff. We're living there. So how about the rest of the land? The rural land, where there are not a lot of people living. Well, hopefully after this lecture you'll know what we are doing with that land and what we are doing to protect and keep that land from disappearing as time goes on. So, if we look at l rural land, there are four main categories of the rural land. There's farmland, rangeland, forestland, national and state parks, and wilderness. Now, some of these seem pretty easy to figure out by just looking at their name, like farmland and forest land. And then others, national and state parks and wilderness, well, you might not know what the difference between those are. But the main thing is, all five of these types of rural land are important to us. We need them to sustain us and to provide us necessary resources and other ecological services that these lands provide us. So we're going to spend the next little while going through each one of these categories of rural land one by one. We are going to start with what hopefully for you guys is the most obvious of these five types of rural land, and that is farmland. Alright, farmland is used to grow crops and fruit, usually stuff we eat or make clothes out of. As we talked about when we talked about the urban sprawl in the, the last lecture, urban development can sometimes threaten farmland, because as urban land develops, as the suburbs spread, they start pushing into some rural lands, and a lot of times that's farmland. All right, in 90, 1996, we started coming up with um, some government regulations, some government programs to help protect this farmland. And uh, we renewed this back in 2008 because we still see the significance that this farmland holds for us. It's where we get crops and fruit. And, you know, crops could be as simple as barley or wheat. Or they could be other crops that can produce some kind of clothing like, like cotton plants. Or produce even other stuff like tobacco. So we, we use farmlands quite a bit to make these crops and stuff. And we want to protect them because we do draw a lot of our food and other resources from them takes us to rangelands, and rangelands kind of go hand in hand with farmlands, except rangelands support grasses and shrubs and even some deserts that are not used for farming, but are used for ranging. All right, so the, the big thing here is they are not used for farming. If they were used for farming, they'd be lumped into that cropland. Rangelands vary in humidity. They can be really dry as the rangelands and deserts of the southwest. Arid is like a fancy word for dry. Or they can be fairly and relatively wet, like a lot of the rangelands of Florida um, can be wet. A lot of times what we use rangeland for is allowing livestock to graze. All right, if you think of the song Home, Home on the Range, well, that's what they're talking about, a place where the deer and the antelope go and play, where they go and graze with each other. So from rangeland, we tend to get cattle for our beef, sheep for wool and for um, some food, Goats for, again, 
goat meat, goat milk, goat cheese. And so most of the time when we look at what we get out of the rangelands, we get meat, milk, wool, and hides. All right. Nat natural native wildlife also graze on these lands. And so because we get food, like um, meat and milk, and anything that comes from milk, all right, cheeses, ice cream, that kind of stuff, we, uh, we need these lands to maintain the world's food supply. All right, and looking at projections, and they're just projections, and, and some models are more aggressive at, at projecting the world's population than others, but if you kind of look like how the population has grown um, over the last 30, 40 years, and we kind of project a similar rate into the future, and, and we think of how much food that we eat now, and as more people show up, how much more food we're going to need. Some estimates show that we might need a 40% increase in the amount of food production from just rangeland to provide enough meat and milk and dairy products for the world population. And this is as looking at the globe as a whole, not just one country. There have been some problems on the rangelands, the main of which is overgrazing. Over it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a loss of the vegetation, losing the grasses and shrubs because of too much feeding or too many animals. What ends up happening is we change the plant community. We change the types of plants... present. All right, as the yummy plants to the cows and the goats get eaten up, they're replaced by non-yummy plants because the cows and goats won't eat them so they have a chance to reproduce. So less desirable plants invade, replace the more desirable, the yummier plant species, and if there is a ridiculous amount of overgrazing, all the vegetation gets eaten. And once those plants are gone, they don't have the roots there to keep the soil there, so the soil has a better chance of eroding and getting moved away, and if there's no good topsoil and no good soil, it's hard to get anything to grow there, and then you don't have anything growing to be eaten, and so you don't really have a rangeland anymore, you have a wasteless use of space. And so that's not good. And um, it's the biggest problem for the range right now is overgrazing. Well, let's head over to the next type of land. That's forest lands. Here's another one where you have to uh, really think hard to think of what are at forest lands. There are trees in forest lands and forests. And we harvest trees all the time for things we use every day. We use paper. That comes from trees. So money. Paper money, grown on trees, comes from trees. Just, you know, we got to process it and print it first. A lot of furniture has wood in it. That comes from trees. Lumber and plywood for building our homes, fixing our homes, making little sheds. All of that comes from trees. We also value or like forest products like turpentine to help clean our paintbrushes and clean off paint spills. And maple syrup, which is more edible than turpentine, and we enjoy these things as well, and they also come from the forest lands. And these are all the, the obvious money-making things that come from the forest that, that we think of right away. But one of the, the biggest jobs a forest does for us is it removes carbon dioxide, which to us is poisonous. If you were to go into a room where there was only carbon dioxide, you would die because you need oxygen to live, and all your, your body uses the oxygen and cellular respiration, produces carbon dioxide, and you breathe that out. The plants take in this carbon dioxide, convert it back into oxygen during photosynthesis. All right. The sad thing is, we use lots of trees. 
All right, if we look at a worldwide average, we use 1,800 cubic centimeters of wood per person each day. Now, what is 1,800 cubic centimeters? Well, if it was a liquid, that would be 1.8 liters. All right, which is pretty close to half a gallon liquid-wise. So each person uses about half a gallon of wood per day. All right, that's in the world. If you look at us in the United States, we use about three and a half times that much. So instead of a half gallon, all right, three and a half times a half is one point, or is uh, almost 5.25 gallons, all right, or let's see, 1,800 we multiply that by 3, that's 5,400. So 6,300 cubic centimeters. So we use a ton of wood per day, and we don't even notice it. All right? And people in developing countries still use firewood as their main source of fuel. They might not have a rich deposit of coal or oil and might not be technologically sophisticated enough to use wind, solar, or even nuclear power or hydropower. They still burn wood as a fuel source to get energy instead of just a heat source and something fun to do on cool summer nights around a lake when we have marshmallows, graham crackers, and chocolate sitting around with nothing to do with it. Now as we harvest trees or cut down trees, we have to look into the forest and there's three types of forests. There's virgin forest and those are forests that have never been cut at all. All right, people have not been in there to cut down the trees at all. There are native forests, which are forests that are planted and managed. We'll talk about the, the ways to manage forest cutting in a, in a little bit here. You can kind of see it at the bottom of the screen. But native forests are, are managed to provide um, lumber and provide for wood products over a long period of time. And then there are tree farms. And you see this a lot, especially right here around Christmas time, if you, if you go and cut down your own Christmas tree. Uh, you see the Christmas trees, they're planted in rows. And we just harvest them, pull them out, cut them down like we would other crops. Like it was wheat or uh, barley. Well, for the most part, like in a native forest where where we're managing the trees, we can either clear cut a forest, which as you can see in this picture right here, you cut everything. You cut it so that the land is clear. Or you selectively cut a forest that you don't cut everything in. The land there is not clear. So clear cutting clears the land. Selective cutting does not. We will talk about both of those in a second. And there we go, our second is gone. So clear cutting is the process of removing all of the trees from an area of land. What this does is it completely destroys the wildlife habitat for anything living in that forest because that forest is now gone and it causes soil erosion because those roots aren't holding the soil in place. Roots hold soil in place. All right, and that goes for really any type of root, but tree roots especially. The other way we can uh, manage forest lands or, or cut down and harvest trees is a process called selective cutting. And in selective cutting, we only remove middle and mature, middle aged and mature trees. We leave the young ones and developing trees alone. It's more expensive, and it's more expensive because you don't get the you don't get as many trees. You you get less trees cut. So you get less wood from this. And also you need somebody to go out there and look at the trees and decide whether they're middle-aged or mature. 
but it is much less disrupt disruptive. Because then what you do is you go and you replace those old trees that you've cut down with saplings, or at least it provides room for new trees to grow. Unfortunately, because it's more expensive, it's usually practiced only over small areas that are owned by individuals instead of large companies or entire governments going and, and cutting large areas of trees. It's a lot easier to just go cut everything down than to go select the good trees to cut. What this has left to, it, or led to, is a environmental problem called deforestation, which you've probably heard before, all right? It's the removal of forests, the clearing of forests. All right, and what we've seen happen is as the population expands, the demand for forest products increases and countries become ex severely deforested or they start losing lots of forest. And they clear cut these forests and they then they, I mean, they use the wood for either energy sources or paper or they sell it as lumber or, or something else. And they try to convert the land to either farmland or they make space for infrastructure, roads, homes, factories, office buildings. Well, what this does is it reduces the wildlife habitat. So you can get rid of some really um, unique places in the world by doing this. It also, if you, especially if you, if you clear forests from hillsides, leads to soil erosion. Which means that you need to quickly cover the land with a crop, with a cover crop, something that you can plant to hold the soil in place. All right, remember what I said. Tree roots hold soil in place. All right, and that's this whole part right here. All right, if you're on a hill, the soil will get wiped off that hill by rainwater or blown away by wind down into the valley and you'll lose the soil from the hill and then the hill is um, kind of useless, at least for growing stuff. Now in tropical rainforest areas, all right, there's lots of land, um, but the soil is really thin. And because of the thin soil, it doesn't make good cropland. So people go in, they clear cut all the trees. Sometimes they just burn the trees right there in something called slash and burn um, harvesting. And they then they grow in, they might get a season or two out of the land, and then they have to move from one plot to the next and clear more forest each time because the land doesn't have enough soil to be useful enough to sustain a farm for any significant amount of time. What many countries in the world are trying to do to kind of make up for this, now that we've been learning more, is reforestation, which is the reestablishment of the forest land. It's the opposite of deforestation. Deforestation takes it down, reforestation puts it back. And there are some places where reforestation is happening faster than deforestation, which is a good thing. That means we're building up more trees. All right, deforestation causes soil erosion, which can lead to landslides or flooding. And that's a very high price. So if we let the forest regenerate itself, let it become replanted, let it kind of heal itself before we keep cutting, we cut out the costs of landslides and flooding, which can, can be very expensive depending on where that landslide happened or where the flooding happened. And there are some governments that now require reforestation after we've removed the timber. After we've removed trees from public land, we have to go back and replant some of them. Although, 
more than 90% of all the timber, more than 90% of all these wood products are coming from forests that are not managed by somebody that monitors south of the forest, so there's probably a lot of clear cutting going on. Although, as a, a worldwide community, we are trying to improve reforestation globally, and there are even private organizations that have started some tree planting programs um, in roadsides and cities, out even out uh, in nature a little bit, just to try to save more of the forest links. If, if we can help manage the forest in a healthy fashion and get um, a good amount of wood out of it, it will only benefit us in the future. So if you clear cut, you're probably not getting that forest back. But if, if you do the selective cutting, you have a chance of, you know, only making more minor alterations to the ecosystem than, than a major one, like clearing all the trees. And then if you ever stop, there's a better chance that forest will recover. This brings us to the parks and preserves, the fourth of the five um, types of rural land. And these started here in the U.S. in the 1970s. And it was people who were exploring Wyoming, right here, and Montana. And if you look right here, Yellowstone, right in the corner of Wyoming and Montana right here, that was the first national park of the U.S. Now, we have about 50 today. And if you notice, a lot of them are, are over here out west. Then there's not a whole lot on the east coast. Well, we had already populated the east coast and, and put a lot of buildings a lot of cities. And, and the, the group that went to Congress didn't want to see the same thing happen out west to all of the um, the wilderness, as it would be, all of the... Wilderness was a bad word. You'll see why on the next slide or two. All of the um, the native forests and all of the, the, the natural land. They didn't want to see that happen out west like it happened here in the east. So we set up these these national parks. Here is why I said wilderness was a bad word to use, and that's because in 1964, we developed the Wilderness Act. All right, the U.S. Wilderness Act, and it designated certain lands as wilderness, and also defined wilderness. And wilderness is a region that is not cultivated or inhabited by humans, so we're not using it as rangeland. We're not living there. It's pure nature. All right, there are 474 regions of wilderness in the U.S. All right, covers 32 million acres designated as wilderness. And the cool thing about wilderness, you can use it for hiking and fishing and camping, and that's about it. We don't build roads in the wilderness. We don't build structures in the wilderness. We don't use motorized equipment in the wilderness. We just go out and we leave it as it would have been found in nature. We might end up finding hiking trails uh, if a lot of people hike in the same area. And um, you might see a canoe or somebody out on a lake or river, but we're not leaving large permanent structures or making significant alterations to these areas. Again, if we look at this map, most of the U.S. wilderness and roadless areas are out west. All right, there are some along the Appalachians, some in Vermont and New Hampshire, a little bit in PA. But for the most part, they are out west. There are dis different designations. And these areas are the only places where unspoiled these virgin forests 
remain. There's also um, unchanged deserts and prairies in these areas. And in these spots, we allow the plants and animal, animals to, to, survive, to, to survive and live in their normal ecosystems. And we hopefully keep them big enough so that they won't disappear. We can use them as classrooms, we can use them as labs to kind of study the animals, try to get an idea of what the continent looked like before humans started interacting with everything. But the main thing is, is we just try to learn about the natural world from them. We can also use them, like I said, for hiking and camping. Um, and just pretty places to go visit. Now, with these protected areas, like a lot of other things, there are threats to them. Now, we were talking about the U.S. here. Alright, so if we look worldwide, the number of people visiting national parks and the wilderness each year are, are, are increasing. And every time people go, they start to leave their mark on the land. All right? They, they don't take out what they bring with them. So litter starts to pile up. Or there ends up being lots of traffic that get close, as you get close to the national parks. Or everybody wants to go visit Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon. And so now there's a line of cars waiting to get there. Alright, sometimes we find stuff like oil or gas underneath these areas. These areas don't have a lot of people around them, so they're a good spot for power plants. Alright, miners and loggers want to get in there because there's a lot of stuff they would mine and log, and so they tend to be right next to or really close to the parks, and they can affect the parks. Plus, these preserved areas are affected by climate change. Alright, and this includes that heat island effect that we talked about, where the local climate changes, because the hot city throws more warm, moist air in the atmosphere and causes more rain. Air and water pollution also don't stay out of these areas. There's, there's no invisible force field to keep pollution out. All right, And pollution happens as we burn and, and build stuff. So there, there's no way, way to keep them out. We try to protect these from damage. But um, the best we can do is uh, limit the number of people permitted in the area, which provides more people wanting to go there. And sometimes we have to close the areas for visitors to allow the wild animals to breed during mating season. Especially female mammals can get very, very protective um, during mating and brooding, brooding season. Mating season might be the males are very aggressive because they're trying to show off that they're the best and should be able to mate with the females. And then after the females have the young, they get very protective. And so little things can really go and um, set them off. We've also added volunteer programs to try to keep these areas in line. And what the volunteers do is they pick up the trash, they build the trails that people should hike on, and in places where it will disrupt as few other organisms as, as possible, and control invading an exotic species that shouldn't be there that might be coming to take over the area, or have been the, placed there accidentally and they're starting to take over the area. And, of course, they educate the visiting public because knowing how to avoid the dangers of ruining a protected area inadvertently is really important. A little knowledge is a powerful thing. And the more people that know how to try to keep these areas safe, the better it is overall for the areas. So that is it for this lecture and for this unit. As always, bring your questions in, and uh, I guess have a good night.